Hello and welcome to the Inquisitorial Archive. My name is Kevin Rourke. It's been a while since I've done a review. Um, just over two years, actually. Um, but it looks like coming back over things. I, for those of you who are wondering, um, and I've probably noticed on the channel, um, I was involved in doing a lot of the uh, Hangout video games, um, recorded ones. Uh, pretty fun. Uh, you know, the ones there's later in the direction as I came along, got involved in running so those took up a lot of time. Um, but uh, I found myself less involved with those of late, um, being I have fewer things. But some people requested a while back, uh, they were wondering when I was going to do reviews of several books, particularly Dark Heresy Second Edition, which is quite a dark cover and the light sources behind. So there we go. That's a you have to see the nice inquisitorial eye, a bit easier there. It's just the lighting. Now, this, of course, is the second edition um, of Dark Heresy. The first edition was written by um, Black Industries, which is a subsidiary of Games Workshop. But then they handed over halfway, well, just after starting, really, over to um, Fancy Flight Games. And really, when it comes to a lot of the mechanics. There has been innovation, but a lot of mechanics. If you have played only War to a lesser extent, uh, Black Crusade, you're going to be very familiar with mechanics. Even if you only played the first Dark Heresy game, you're going to be familiar with some stuff, but there's been incremental changes. Different things. That's some stuff that only suits certain systems. Like, there's not comrades like there are in only war. But you've got a lot of different things. I'd like to tell you about it. Um, so for the base mechanics, like I said, it's really very similar to Only War. You're going to find a lot of it the same, like, okay, you're doing single shots and that kind of thing. Well, you can single shot where you're going to aim plus 10, single shot is going to give you a plus 10, whereas a full auto is going to give you a minus, a minus 10, and semi auto will give you just a flat bonus. Uh, the mechanics generally work out relatively easy for doing most skill checks and kind of things. Uh, the GM will ask the players to make a test of a certain skill or maybe one or two different skills or occasionally just a, a raw stat. But you apply a stat, sorry, a skill to a stat, uh, ranging from plus zero to plus 30. Now, if you don't have the skill, as long as it doesn't break down further, like operate, for example, it's the drive skill. There's like, you know, operate ground vehicles, that kind of thing. Because they break down so much and lowers, you just don't necessarily know these things. Um, if it's a specialization, it just breaks down too much. You you can't roll without it. But if you if it's not a special a special skill, um, you can roll at minus twenty the, the stat that's being applied. But they've generally speaking, they, they got rid of talented. You might remember that was in there for a while. Um, talented is no longer there. It wasn't in only war either. So this, that's why the skill doesn't just go up to plus twenty now. It goes up to plus thirty. But there's no talents for those who aren't familiar with the newer ones. Um, but one of the things which was a improvement, I felt as well, is putting in alternate stats that could be applied to the skill. Now, of course, the gym could have potentially done this themselves, right? But there's something in the rulebook going, well, sometimes a different skill is going to be more applicable here or whatever. Um, so, for example, if you're rolling for a common or a common or imperium, you might, um, the GM might agree, okay, well, no, you can roll your fellowship because you're talking to more people about different things than just raw intelligence, more social characters because they're commonly understood things. Then again, depends. There's a bit of variety there. It makes sense. It gives some suggestions, but really, and it gives some here associates after sometimes the GM lets you roll. Yeah, that's fine. Um, Generally, compared to some of the earlier editions, the skills have been refined down further. Um, and that works out pretty well. Um, but some of the skills have been expanded upon a bit, which could potentially slow down the game. Um, I'll get to that. Particularly Forbidden Lords of Xenos has a little bit of... It's not settling well for me so far. Um, when it comes to the mechanics, it generally plays quite well. Much like, um, much like, uh, I believe it was as far as Black Crusade, but also in Only War. When you get a critical hit, you don't do additional damage. You get a roll on a critical hit table, and uh, we get a Righteous Fury. 
as I say, which goes on the critical head table. Um, so if you roll a, a 10, a natural 10 on the dice, you get to roll, you, um, you don't have to confirm, which I can only warn, you will automatically confirm. And then you roll a d5, unmodified by talents and abilities and things. And it usually, sometimes it could be you stun the opponent, uh, you cause a little fatigue. Generally, it means the bad guys will last a little bit longer. Now, I have noticed that the NPCs that are up in the book, they're not as worried about giving them a lot more hit points than before, but they generally try to keep the stats fairly grounded. Um, for particularly for boss guys, they've got more um, they've got more wounds than they would have had in previous editions, because I think they kind of realized like by trying to keep wounds low, they ended up in adventures going, crap, this guy's a little bit, you know, you know, I've I've got to give him a force fill, I've got to give him this, I've got to give him that, he's got to have all these things sick, and it didn't always work out the best. In some of the pre-made adventures, that kind of type thing, so. They kind of get away from that. Now, they had an optional rule in the first edition when it came in, in Ascension, where it had you can't have over 25 wounds. If you have over 25 wounds, you, you, you can't look like a normal human. Have that. Now, if you're some giant Adeptus Mechanicus Magus Militant, yeah, sure, fine, because you don't look normal, you don't look human. But a lot of the mechanics are going to be familiar. Um, but again, some more specific mechanics. Like I said, they're the special skills. You'll find a lore spoken down to forbidden lore, scholastic lore, common lore. Same as before. Very interesting. But because I, I do like it, it is open ended and they do have ones because if you're familiar to other games, you can turn on GM and go, oh, look, I'd like to get this particular lore. It's like, well, that's not normal. This one's like, yeah, but it comes up with the other one and shows I've got it. And I'll do this. As long as GM doesn't get too finicky on, well, this is the only one because this is thing. Um, but Forbidden Lord Xenos. Um, this is more... Like, initially, I was like, okay, that's interesting. It's like, I don't entirely like this part because before, you just had Forbidden Lord Xenos. And we had Forbidden Lord Xenos. It was an orc, or it was an elder, or it was a ragdoll. Um, the GM said, I rolled Forbidden Lord Xenos to give you a appropriate modifier. And if you pass, you got whatever information. Now, rather than just being Forbidden Lore Xenos, you have Forbidden Lore Xenos Orcs, which you can only roll for Orcs. When you buy Forbidden Lore Xenos, you have to pick this is Orcs. And I I believe, I will double check this, because I'm not 100% sure of this, but I believe that if you take Forbidden Lore Xenos Eldar, that actually has to be Forbidden Lore Xenos Craft World Eldar, or Forbidden Lore Xenos Dark Elder. Now that that is not fantastic because that's gonna land you in an awkward situation. So for Forbidden Lore Xenos, blah, blah, blah. yeah, Craft World Elder or Xenos, the two examples they have are Forbidden Lore, it's Xenos, Craft World Elder, or Forbidden Lore Xenos Orcs. If you're doing a game which is based heavily around being members of the Ordo Xenos, it's like, oh, great, we have to get some, it's pretty if you're the sage group, because, if you're, hey, if you're running around working for the Ordo Malaeus, and for yes, those of you who don't know things, I can explain some of these things. I've explained before in different videos, but yeah, like, see, it, the 40 universe is very large, but you've got different branches of the Inquisition. The Ordo Malaeus are demonology. They deal with demons and, you know, chaos cults, and all these horrible cults things. And the Ordo Freticus deal with heretics. Uh, rogue psychers, um, recidivists, uh, and that kind of type thing. But Xenos, because you could be dealing with all kinds of Xenos, if you're the sage in the party, if you're the guy who's like, I have the knowledge, the guys confirm me, but it's like, it's like, what one do I get? How many to do my job? So let's say you want to cover the basics, the basics, the more common races. Uh, I'm not talking about like Necrons or if your game isn't in the Eastern Fringe, you don't have to worry about Tau, but you're going to go, okay, Forbidden Lore, Xenos, Orcs. Forbidden Lore, Xenos, Craft World Eldar. Forbidden Lore, Xenos, Dark Eldar. And seeing as Craft World Eldar specific, um, depends on the, how the GM's feeling. Is he going to allow Eldar Corsairs to come under Craft World Eldar, or, or like either of those first to apply? Or not, then you also got to think about local things like for your 
operating in the Chromos expansion permission um, due to our Marzino's Rackal, which that's not necessarily as applicable, but you then have to go like, well, I need to know about Genius Theater, so we go out for Ben Lorzinos Tyranids. Um, if you're doing the MSN to Jarek Reach or somewhere in the Eastern Fringe, you start worrying about Forbidden Lorzinos Tau, Forbidden Lorzinos Crew, because if it's fitting out to Craft World Eldar, and for us it's all Craft Worlds, um, so if the, GM, if, the go, if the GM goes Forbidden Lorzinos Tau Empire, that might apply to Crew, Tau. Demiurg, uh, Guela, human, humans working for the greater good. Um, so you got a bit of a, particularly if you're playing in a Rosinus game, like, and I, I can see why they maybe decided let's move away from this because, um, you know, it's like, okay, you know, Nork is great, good for you. But yeah, you, you, you just got this one set and it covers so much in Warhammer 4000 Universe, is a big thing. Whereas, I don't know. That seems a bit... It got broken down too far, especially because they only give you two examples. Um, thankfully, they didn't go, you know, orcs by tribe because that would have been completely boom. They'd have been in specific craft worlds. Thankfully, they didn't, didn't do that. That would be really... Ugh. But um, just something as a GM, people want to take A lot of people... I, can see, I imagine a lot of games, GMers went, for an Xenos, we'll keep it the way it's been. The other games works fine. I've toyed around in my head of doing games where you go, okay, Forbidden Lore, not just Xenos, but uh, instead of just Forbidden Lore Xenos, if you had it going, Forbidden Lore, Tau Empire. Um, forbidden Lore Orcs. Now, for, uh, you know, for, uh, Forbidden Lore, you know, Xenos Orcs. Forbidden Lore, Xenos Elder. Not breaking down Craft World, Dark Elder, Corsair, Exodite, Harlequins. This is going to you know, you're not going to get a full list there. It's like if you if you if you go to fairly broad, groups, or you had forbidden Norsinos common, which is you can go. This is going to come over, you know, basic, relatively common information. So you can go, oh, that's an Eldar. Yeah, that's a craft world Eldar. You might be able to go of such and such a craft world, and you might be able to go, oh, that's a dire Avenger, and you might be able to you know recognize different things. But when it comes to more specific details, like as a harlequin, uh, what the harlequins do, or more unusual xenos, like, or you could basically break down, like I said, Tau Empire doing things. You could go uh, warp xenos to cover things like cyclone and vampires, which have been since first edition. Um, <laughs> that's in Rogue Trader first edition, um, and I believe in fourth edition they got a mention again in the. I was looking at a Black Templar Codex player. But that's one of just the more finicky things. They do have improved certain things. One thing is they have a crafting system in the core rulebook. They finally have an item crafting system, which is really useful, particularly given how acquiring items work out. There's some things on the rulebook because you have trades. You have to trade armor skills of weapons, armor things. And they say, like, trade armor, this is used for making weapons and armor. But then they have tech use, lets you mix weapons and armor. Where I've always had a bit of a gripe with 40 RPGs where they've had, oh, well, I've got tech use, and tech use is basically, I wave my hands, that covers all techno almost all technology, unless it's Xenos and often the full cover Xenos stuff. Uh, for, you know, if it's Archaeotech or something, you might be required to roll a different skill. If they'd been handling things a bit better from the start, you would have been sitting there going, well, you know, you have common lore text you're able to identify. It's like, oh, well, I don't necessarily able to operate this, but I know that's a such and such type ship. You know, I know the basic details. Can I fix it? No. It's like, by lumping it all together, seeing as it's such a awkward section of 40k, the difficulties surrounding technology. It just always seemed to me with common lore tech and things like that not being there enough. It got distilled down to just tech use. Essentially, for the first couple levels, and the, the GM can't or couldn't enforce for a very long time the oh, well, you know, you should have common or tech inference. And in fairness, sometimes GM could work out, but they do have it'll take a random number of hours for your lab make a check, and they've got different amounts of success you need for different things. How I've tried to balance this in the games I've been running, um, so it's not just oh, well, tech use will do this, whatever. 
what I've done is I came up with a slightly more advanced because it doesn't have, although it has rules for crafting, it doesn't have for better or poorer quality. So for better quality stuff, what I did was you would automatically get max on the time required before you can make a check. So it might be D5 or D10, I can't remember which, for weapons. Rather than being D5 hours, D10 hours, you don't need to make it every 10 hours. You need the same number of successes, but you get it. But I would say you need the specific trade skill to make this. So instead, of, you can make it a, a sort of black armor tech use, but you need trade armor to make good or best quality black armor, which gives a little bit of advantage. Guys want to do that, plus it can be very cool, which I like as well. You can use Medicaid to make drugs, but if you want to make good or best quality, if you want to make superior, um, if you want to make uh, superior pharmaceuticals, whether it be to murder somebody or treat somebody with different things, the guy who actually has trade chemist comes out a bit ahead. So that's how I've dealt with that. Now, character creation. I really like how to do it. In some ways, it's got some similarities to how when Fantasy Fly first came in. Um, you can see similarities with, with some of the stuff. It's not, it's not it, it like in Only War, because Only Wars are much, you're part of the regiment, you're soldiers in the front lines. Um, it is closer to how did in Rogue Trader, where you had this big padding. They got rid of the padding, but you have tree steps. You choose your home world, you choose your background, you choose your role. So home world is going to be like your highborn, so you're as noble, that kind of thing, um, or you're born a forge world or a hive world. If you've got all these, but it gives suggestions on what the next step for your character might be. Like, oh, you know, these guys are commonly this, these guys are commonly this. But then it has what organization, your background, which is basically what organization were you part of or attached to. And they do have an outcast where you just don't fit in with the other ones. Um, you've got Adeptus Arbites, Imperial Guard. Now, one thing is, compared to Dark Earth the First Edition characters, you're starting a lot more powerful, you're starting a lot more combat. You're starting off pretty much around rank three, would it be, like power level wise. You're just a lot more competent and stuff. And then you move off and you choose your, uh, you've got like a deficit administrator and stuff as another background. There's a, there's a few of them, they're pretty cool. And then lastly, you choose your role. And this is where I think it's actually working out pretty well, pretty, pretty clever. Because you have Shirujan, which is basically surgeon and doctor. You've got assassin, warrior, sage, seeker, um, desperado. But each different homeworld, each different background, each different role gives you a different benefit and what's pretty cool is there's effectively a sage like character in the game i'm running but he's not actually the sage role he's the seeker role. he's more investigative finding out things he does have some lores and things but he's more about finding and investigating different things which his bonus with the seekers when he makes um inquiry or awareness checks he can choose instead to spend a fate point and i think he gets automatic gets a number of degrees of success equal to his perception bonus, which is 10 is his perception. Which works out pretty well for him. And it's pretty interesting, whereas if he was a sage, whenever he'd have to make a... I think it's a very simple lore's checks. If he has the skill, he could roll it. Um, instead of rolling, you know, he can spend a point. Bang, he gets a number of... Uh, I think it's equal to his intelligence bonus. Um, he gets that many degrees of automatic success. Of course, he'll be burning through. But if you're just doing it the whole time, but it's pretty cool. A little bit similar to the uh, the rogue trader seven skills for him, but each one is different. They give different abilities. But what you can do with this is, for example, the first character I did, I chose highborn, imperial guard, sage. The idea was he was an imperial guard officer, but rather than being ridiculously good in combat himself. He is very well educated. Um, he's got some strong social skills. Um, he is very much a gentleman officer. Although he'll stand in line, he'll fight. Um, it's more about having the tactics. He would have, if he hadn't been snapped up and uh, you know brought into working for the Inquisition, uh, he was lieutenant, had a platoon that stage, because it's Imperium, even if he wasn't ridiculously experienced in the, in the field. Nobles get ahead. You know, he probably had a brighter career ahead of him, but now he's an in Inquisition, he's doing different things, but because of a Sage, he gets lowers a lot easier, 
He understands different things, and he can wheel and deal. He can do the politics. He's used to that kind of side, which is a lot of fun. Whereas if I made an imperial, like a high-born imperial guard warrior, it'd be a very different guy. Um, there are two guys both playing the seeker. The seeker defines your aptitudes a lot. Um, you get a bonus as well, but the majority of your aptitudes are coming from your role. I've got two seekers. I've got the um, Shrine World admi at this is Administratum um, Seeker, who, as he says, his character comes from taxes and tithes, division for the Aptus Administratum, you know, because he's going through the paperwork trying to find fails. He does well there. But the other guy is going off the, um, the alternate rank that was in the Inquisitor's Handbook for Dark Heresy First Edition. Um, he really always liked the idea of the Reclamator. So his character was born on a forge world. Um, he the outcast, or no, he did, it was, I think he might have been, yeah, it was the outcast background. Even though he wasn't born to forge world, he understood some things from that. But he had the seeker, and the seeker's got a little more of a text slant than the sage, um, a little more investigation. Whereas the sage can have more, you know, they, they both have their different focuses. Um, but even though they both have the same role, which applies to a lot of the same attitudes, their slant is very different. One of them, you know, he goes through the paperwork and things, and the other guy's very hands-on technical. He's not a tech priest, but he is used to repairing, figuring out if this can be repaired, this can be salvaged, going on things. And it's been very fun seeing him doing that. It's very fun seeing the because it'd be very straightforward to just go, okay, I will take a high world imperial guard wire, which would be no problem. That'd be the work really well, but one of the guys in the game said, Highborn Imperial Guard Assassin. So although his guy has experience in Imperial, he's or a duelist in some respect well not quite a duelist in some respects, but he you know, his guy can bluff, he can lie his way into social circles, he can go off and he can kill people in duels because he's no whatever he needs to. He can get his way into certain circumstances like that. Or he can kill somebody with the last rifle because he's he was training for that kind of thing. Um, so that's actually pretty cool. Uh, the homeworld and the background uh, stages will both give you a bonus aptitude, and you'll add your aptitudes. To get, uh, you'll add those together with your aptitudes from your role. And bam, there we go. Oh, there's also like Adeptus Astro Telepath card. There's a mystic uh, as background, and then there's the mystic um, role. It works out pretty well. Um, they do have a later advance. So you only have three. In the book and Lee Vance and this are basically like they've been more akin to alternate ranks in some ways in the in the older editions, but there are no ranks anymore. You have the aptitudes like you do in Only War. So if you have the more aptitude, there's you can have, there's be two linked aptitudes for a skill. The more linked aptitudes you have, the more your uh, the cheaper it'll be. If you have two aptitudes for it'll be very cheap. If you have one, medium cost. If you have none of them, it'll be expensive, but you can still buy it. So characters can grow more organically, more fluidly, and it works out a lot better like that. Um, you have 1,000 XP to spend at the end of character creation, and you can get a few, um, you can get a few skills. What I always say, you can get a few, um, a few items. Now, when it comes to the, uh, The advancement, um, I've generally found it works quite well. I know some people, I've heard apparently some people have issues with the, oh, there's min max stuff, but uh, uh, that, I, I would regard that as more of a problem with the, your, your player group than anything, because aside from your role, you can't, you know, you, you, you know your role determines the vast majority of what you have. You get some slight, you get, one, you get two additional aptitudes to modify that from your background, your homeworld. But I was saying about Psyker. They have Psyker, Inquisitor, and Null. Now, this is the area where I'm going to get a little bit more... Yeah, I'm not so sure about. Um, I haven't had somebody play Psyker. I do like how the Psyker powers are working in it. Um, but I haven't had somebody play a Psyker in the game. I mean, I've been in the game with a Psyker. Um, and th that's worked out pretty well. I actually like the way they've got the rules done. They've, they've really done a much better job balancing it there. Um, but... With the Psyker, you you only have three blade fans. Now there is the enemies within book has recently released. That you'll have some additional options, but the Inquisitor is only going to uh, come in 
if your GM as it all them, it's if your GM allows it. Okay, fair enough. You have to pay a certain amount of XP to get into these um, with the character. You have to meet certain prerequisites. But the Inquisitor is fairly high level. You need seventy-five influence, bare minimum. Bare minimum. You get access to talents nobody else can get. Sorry, sorry about that. Talents nobody else can get. And this can be. And I'm not trying to bash it. Is this going to. Psychers are the ones you're going to most come, often come across. Null, I can't imagine my people allowing nulls in the game. Some people do. I'm not a big fan. Um, but then you've got the. Inquisitor. One or two of the abilities just really bugged me because. Okay, we've gotten to the level of, uh, you know, basically one of the PCs become the Inquisitor. You're taking more hands on what you're going to do. And then you're sitting there going, okay, he has to pay 1,000 XP. He has to meet the prerequisites. You know, GM must be okay with it. But you've got a bunch of talents only they can get. Now, this isn't the same as Ascension's talents for, you know, the that's open for Dark Arts and First Edition. But, for example, this is one I've, I've issues with. Jack of all trades. It's tier 2 talent, intelligence 45, aptitude, knowledge. Just has knowledge. Okay, it's only got one. That's a, you know, this is the first time I've seen word. And it's, it's one or two decent single. There's one aptitude. That is it. Uh, it doesn't say general as well. So clearly, they're putting a bit of a weird bar there where, at best, you're only getting medium cost. You can't get cheap cost. But when this talent is acquired, the character gains all unknown, non special skills. No, uh, as known skill rank, I rank one. Not, not that they can roll it as if they had it. They just have it. And then they've got Master of All Trades, which is the same thing except for trying to. So if you get into this, like, boy, it, it's just. Before, when I play games of Ascension things, when it's gone well, it's a case of well, the Inquisitor's really skilled. But, and this is, it comes up more in Rogue Trader games, because you get to play Rogue Trader games often, but, yeah, I, yeah, this person, they're in charge, they've got their different thing, but the people around them that are the other PCs, these guys should not be dismissed casually. They are skilled, they're powerful, they're resourceful, because you can't have every skill under the earth. Now you can. You can get go off, and for the specialists, a lot of them, you can go off, you can get infused knowledge, which will let you roll for all the common class score skills. You can get hotshot pilot, which will let you roll the operate skills if you have them. So, but with two talents, and there are other use of talents there, with two talents, you can just go straight. You could, if you if you just took these, like well. Yeah, I've took these two talents now. I've got plus 10 in all these skills. My skills are now at plus 10. Now, you don't get refunded XP half for things, but it's like, that is really powerful. Now, if it, if it said, you can roll them as if they had plus 10, that doesn't seem like a big difference, but to me it would be. That would be a huge difference. So that's the way i probably house rule for a game. Because you go, okay, well, the team is going to let me get it up, so if somebody's being really sneaky, they could go. And, of course, it's this could be a problem for just this game. It could be the players, but I can just see, well, I can see other people being annoyed because, okay, well, I've had to bring up this skill. I've had to bring up the things, but he's playing the Inquisitor now. He's bought these two talents. He's got plus 10 in it because he's got plus 10 all zero things. Now, he's just going to buy plus 20. If you had it at, you can roll as if you had it at plus 10, but you do not have the skill trained up to plus 10. That'd make a big difference, because if you wanted to get up to plus 20, you'd have to buy it rank 1, then rank 2, and then you could buy it rank 3, at the aptitudes for that skill, which would make a big difference. I just, I would be worried you could end up marginalizing the other players in the game. And the Inquisitor can do everything, because the Inquisitor is an Inquisitor. But, I digress to a degree. Um, the advancement goes pretty well. Um, if you know only war, similar thing. Um, obviously, you know, regiment is that. Your, your aptitudes are mainly set by your role, but that works out pretty well because it gives you options. Um, psychic powers. 
much improved off some of the previous editions. Um, particularly the old road trailer that just annoyed the hell out of me because that's the first of all in the the current real framework. It's been tweaked and involved in different things, but the current real framework for Cypress, because <laughs> Dark Earth's first edition, the powers were the mechanics were quite different to the other stuff. Now you get to focus power tests, which will usually go off your old power. There's a difficulty set by the power, you know, it might be particularly easy, it might be particularly difficult. And you decide, are you doing this power fettered? Unfettered or pushing. If you do it fettered, which is um, half or less of your psi rating, your total psi rating, um, no psychic phenomenon. Great. If you do it unfettered, it's just a normal roll. But remember, for every um, psi rating you use, you're going to get a plus five to use the power. But you can push, and depending whether you're bound or unbound psych or whatever, you can get between a one and five bonus to your psi rating for using power. But if you do it unfettered, although you get this bonus, you will automatically do psychic phenomenon with a bonus of a plus five to your roll for every psi rating you use beyond your normal. So that's actually pretty cool. Now, one thing to do to make it a little bit nicer is normally when you use psychic power, if your roll doubles, psychic phenomenon, bad things happen. It's obviously, sorry, it's not automatically happening if you push. Unless your roll doubles on your D100. You're going to do psych from us. So it's very likely. Now, how they've balanced and retweeted, which I really like. I believe it was different in only war, and I really like this very much. Okay, you're pushing, you're drawing an X, all this extra psi rating. Great. For. Sorry, no, I've, I've gained a little bit confused. I've read only war there, there, there. You don't get the plus five or everything. For every one psi rating, you use less than your normal. Psi rating, you get a plus 10 to cast it. And the Psy rating will affect it, what does going off. But you decide where you're casting, what you're doing. For every one you go over, pushing, you get a minus 10. So you push like plus 3, that's a minus 3 to cast. Because yeah, you're drawing way more power. But you've got a little bit of an issue there. It's going to be much more difficult. Which is great because I was sometimes to like, oh, I'll push it. Like, you can't be like, there's a reason aside from just safety, which safety should be a good enough reason anyway. But yeah, I need this tiny effect. I'm not going to hit it hopeful whammy. I'm going to use finer control. I use my power as much. It just works out really well. Um, I've seen it in play. I haven't read all the psychic powers, so there might be, you know, some broken ones after just had ones the NPCs have used. Um, but generally, I like how the psychic powers work, which is usually a big gripe for me in 40k games because psychic powers are supposed to be dangerous in 40k. It's a very big, very clear bit in the background. Some people get very flippant with them. And when the system pats you on the back and says, Yeah, go, go abuse them like it does in Rogue Trader, um, a previous 40k uh, role playing game, that annoys me. I'm not saying that you can't go off and you should, you know, use a great powers because, yeah, you're a crazy, scary psyker. But it shouldn't just. The system shouldn't make it too safe. Um, they have two. They have a few new mechanics. Um, two of the big ones are influence and subtlety. Uh, subtlety is a little bit easier to talk about, so I'll do that quickly first. You start with influence of 50 in subtlety. As you do actions, as the players do actions, the GM secretly increases and decreases the subtlety. There are times when you'll get into, into pre-made adventures, but even when you're not doing pre-made adventures, I do, did it myself. Um, okay, well, the players want to do something. It's like, yeah, well, you know, the players are making a little bit of a scene, or even if they haven't been a scene, how are the, the general underworld near the tribe? Because if they hear the Inquisitions in town, they might go to ground. Then again, if you want to see who, if you're already watching area and already discreet, there's advantages and disadvantages to how subtle you're being. But you roll, and if you get under the subtlety rating of the group, you know, it affects how the NPCs are acting. If they're worried that not necessarily they might not have to see Inquisition, but they've been hearing that there have been guys who walk around asking questions, maybe they decide it's uh, time to hire uh, 
a few more um, tugs to help them. Maybe they decide something else. But your influence is very your your subtlety is. I just like the mechanic. Now, when you go between worlds because it's a different world, um, it gravitates two d ten towards fifty to to a stopping point of fifty. So if you're below it. Well, you've been really obvious. Like, if you blow 50, well, you've been a bit more obvious about what you've been doing. So, you'll gravitate up. Um, because, yeah, they wouldn't necessarily have heard all the rumors because it's not their world. Um, however, if you've got a really high subtlety, and it's like you've got really good cover stories based in, cover different things, it won't carry over quite as much because you've got to reestablish and make those identities known, different things. And I like that. But it's not just a case of higher subtlety is better. I prefer higher subtlety. That's the kind of game I like to play. Um, but as I kind of put it, lower subtlety groups at some points are is better because the enemies might get nervous and freak out because the Inquisition's in town. They know about different things. It gives a, a, a <laughs> It works out pretty well. Um, but even if on average, I think having a higher subtlety is better. There are definitely versions lower subtlety is better. And there's an optional, I think it's in the GM's case, it might be in the choral book. Whenever the group finish a mission and you're giving them influence because they've made, you know, they've made contacts, their renown's going better in certain circles, roll against their subtlety. If you fail, this is actually good from that regard because their exploits are better known. However, if they've been really subtle, their names haven't come up, they've been cleaning everything up, whatever people. The average uh, guy in the street doesn't even know when issues come up and they've already dealt with it. It, it works to their advantage. Generally, except in this case, where it's like, well, the stories of your heroism aren't known by your peers that well because you've just been so discreet. So you get one less influence because your fame, your, the respect you have in your peers, you're being so discreet, it's not known as much. That's a trade-off. You know, um, it depends how the group wants to operate. And as we've seen in previous editions, different groups of acolytes, different inquisitors, they operate differently. Influence. Um, in some ways, it's similar to the influence they had in Ascension. Obviously, that's where some things kicked off. Or the profit factor is the the grand this version in some ways. Uh, it's closer to infamy than any of the previous ones, I suppose, in many ways. Your influence is a stat. You roll up in character generation like any other. Um, but instead of going off and buying advances to increase it, you don't get to do that by doing actions, by making connections. So if you go off and go out of your way to make uh, alliances, different things, it can increase. You can decrease by you know, making horrible mistakes. It's basically you're, you're renowned in certain circles. The kind of pull and connections and ties you have works out pretty well. You use this. There's no thrones like there was in Dark Heresy First Edition. Um, it's closer to profit factor or using infamy for acquiring items. There's a table, which is a bit harsher. There's no scaling like there is in, in Rogue Trader, as in you don't get a bonus because you're only buying one. And it's it's a minus 10 as early as scarce. So you go to rare, it's minus 20. Very tough to buy things. And if it's got a minus, you're going to end up with a, for the, the 10s of the minus, will be a hit yourself if you try and buy the item because, hey, did you hear it? Or were these guys on the docks buying a load of you know, long lasses, but your sniper rifles. And, you know, one of them was even went off and pulled a bolt pistol. So it'll hit your subtlety. Thing is, the group doesn't know what their subtlety is. That's one of the things I should make clear. The GM does. It's a secret stat. So you might think you're great. Whatever. In my own game, it's fluctuated. Um, it's gone between high 60s and high 40s. It's actually gone down like the so low 40s, actually, one's edge. Um, but generally being in the high 60s, it goes up and down depending on the actions you do. do. And the players are kind of aware of this. And it kind of stops them from going off and going Inquisitor Smash. Not that I think they would terribly often, but you know, when it's appropriate, they'll go, well, we can't be too subtle about this. We have to move more openly right now. Um, 
but there's no you can only roll for X number of items in the game. You can roll for a lot. And if you have the commerce skill, you can do an opposed your commerce versus the merchant's commerce or their willpower. For every 10 you beat them by um, in this opposed, opposed check, so for every degree you beat them by in this opposed check, you will get an additional plus 10 to acquiring the item. So characters are very good at doing connections here. You know, I like the way I like to see imagine influence and just money, but you have connections, you're doing favors, you're calling up people you've had before, basically getting different things. You, you know, it's sometimes if you're trying to get it, it work like this. One thing that actually makes the influence uh, trying to get things and how to subtly impacts is the Adeptus Ministratum characters have a thing called Master Paper. Now, this one's like, I put a house rule on it, slight tweak. When they're trying to acquire items, they make the rarity one easier than normal. So if it's rare, it becomes scarce. So if said minus 20, it's minus 10. Which, as you're imagining, hey, if that's scarce, it's minus 10. You go down to plus zero, you can start getting scarce items. Well, no problem. This will be really nice. Um, what I it 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 can let you acquire things easier. It can let you acquire things without attracting attention as much, or at least reducing the amount of subtlety you're going to lose, because, you know, you're using all sorts of finicky bureaucracy or different ways. Um, they have a similar thing for being a member of the Adeptus Mechanicus, except for instead of just general things, it's two degrees easier, sorry, no, two steps easier in the rarity to find cybernetics and mechanics. I like that. It's pretty solid. It's a character that helps, them, helps the tech priests, you know, bulk up. Uh, that's like another thing is like I actually like is you can play you could have a group of tech with like half the group or tech priests and they're not overlapping ridiculous ones because even if they're all a depth mechanicus uh background from forge world home worlds which not all tech priests are you could have a shrewgen who's a surgeon who's a doctor who's more to the biological kind of side of things you could have a seeker who's trying to find things, which would work really well for a character who was part of an explorator fleet or that kind of stuff, and who's doing investigations, and just a sage, just studying and learning things. Um, I like that. I like how that works out. It's pretty solid. Um, but one thing I would do for those abilities, I do not allow the rare the rarity decreasing abilities work on items that are near unique or unique. Those are, first off, they're really powerful. Secondly, yeah, you've got strings and stuff, and you're a tech priest, but making a bail fly, which is near unique, be very rare for you just because you're a member of the Depths of Mechanicus background. We're not even tech priest, but just remember member of Depths of Mechanicus background. You're attached to everything else. Going from near unique to very rare is like, ooh, hold on a minute, that's, whoa, that's too good. Whereas going from extremely rare to rare, it's not as big of a deal to me. Um, but that works out pretty well. Um, your, your starting gear is generally going to be a lot more solid. It depends on your background. Your background gives you your gear. Um, some of the other new mechanics are... Oh, wait. I should put, yeah, this is a new mechanic, but it's tied to an influence. Um, whenever you buy the peer background, you increase your influence stat by one. That's one way you can increase it, but it's an indirect thing. When you buy peer, you increase your sap one. So if you buy a peer enforcers, you increase your influence sap one. That's an expensive to do because you're only getting one up, and it can decrease for various different things. But it's pretty nice. Um, one of the cool things they have in the book is they have some sample characters in a fortress called reinforcement characters. If you can get to GM to agree, it'll be reasonable for one of these characters to come and aid you because you've, you know, you've basically put your feeders out in a position to get additional help. You're, you're an Ordo Zemo cell. You've come across a Gene Seer cult. You found that there's a Gene Seer cult on such and such planet. You can turn around and go, I would like to spend influence to get a Dead Watch ring, which if it's just a one guy, I like to think of as a Kill Marine, if you know the lingo. But you could just go, yeah. I want that guy to come over here, help me. Um, and the player who does it, other people can help spend influence, but one player does it in particular. You re permanently reduce 
your influence stat by a certain amount. So it's a lot more fluid and stuff. You can reduce it by a certain amount, uh, which is reduced by if you've appear for the group that's applicable, like you said, the example of which was applicable, you will reduce the amount of influence you're going to lose by two. And if you're a highborn character, because you do background bonus breeding counts, any influence losses you lose are reduced by one to a minimum of one. So if you've dark broken peer and you're a highborn character, you can kind of see where I'm going here with the, the connection stuff. If you're getting somebody in who uses a four influence to call them in, well, you get the background, it's two gone, and you've got breeding counts bringing down by a further one. So you're only using one to get this guy to come in and help you. Now, for a Death Watch Marine, that's a lot more powerful. I believe they cost like nine to bring in. If you've peer depth of strategies, uh, reduce it down to seven. So. Seven, even if you have the appropriate beer, seven is a lot. That's a lot of us, but you can call them in. I actually have ideas for a few games where if the player decided, you know what, this sounds like super really tough. If everyone was off to spend influence, we're like, we're spending seven influence for each player or whatever, which is a huge investment. We've got an entire Death Watch Kill team coming to do with this. And, you know, the GM might sit down with the players and they go stack these characters out, and you're doing the Puppet masters, you've got your cells in different places, you're doing your different things, and you're sending in to deal with these users, you're sending in a Deathwatch kill team, which you could break out the Deathwatch rule books or make some hack version of whatever. Um, but they do have an example of Deathwatch Marine. They've got a an assassin. They've got like a official assassin, norm assassin, which costs a lot. They've got a Grey Knight and Terminator armor. It costs 16 to call it, but it's a Grey Knight and Terminator armor. This is not something you're gonna do like, and it has to make sense. The GM has to agree. Yeah, no, there has to be a re there has to be a speed within reason how these guys can come in. Now it does have that thing of like, well, the players turn around and go, well, we're gonna get a that was space to come in. That might impact your subtly. It depends on the that which marine, but it's a case of if a space marine's being seen in the area, you better believe every anyone even I did a whiff of heretical things going on with them, they're gonna go to the ground. You know, you, you if 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 you use it too flagrantly, you're gonna have to. But that's just common sense in GM's part. Um, but I do see a lot of potential for that. Um, they do have vehicles in the core of the book, very similar to only the ones. Um, some stuff like fatigue and blood loss of change, blood loss instead of just ten percent chance of dying every round, gives you point of fatigue every round, I believe. And fatigue affects you. It, Differently, it's going after toughness. Well, once you get uh, all your toughness bonus, I'm not sure if you just go unconscious. I don't think you get the minus ten straight away, but it's something like um, you take penalties to all your checks off certain stats or that kind of thing. But um, one of the other new mechanics that was very interesting to put in is disposition and personalities. Um, they have it run, it's like, oh, well, I did well on my charm check. Uh, surely this NPC should tell me this thing. It's like, just if you're not sure, like, obviously, I've heard, like, role play out sometimes different things, but sometimes you're just going, oh, we'll just roll it. Um, you know, if it's just a light thing, it's like, well, you're trying to convince this guy. He's like, or James, like, you're sitting there, so James going, I'm not sure if they tell him or not. Even disposition that goes up and down with NPCs, and if the players approach the NPC in the right way, which for its own thing could just be interrogating them, slamming against the wall, but I guess it's a terrible move to make because you're really going to draw their ire. Um, you roll, and if you get under a disposition, maybe they're a little bit more comfortable around the PC, they've taken more of a liking to the PC. Um, some GMs will just for some of this completely role-playing, but if you're a little bit unsure, disposition is pretty cool. That I haven't used a huge amount, but I have used it a bit. Um, Personalities is kind of cool because it gives you an idea of if you have this set up beforehand. As one of those, I've been because I, I kind of forget about it in game. I'll be honest with you. Um, it goes, they react better or worse to different social skills. Some personality types. So you got aggressive personality type. You know, you've got submissive. You got different things. They're more responsive to different types of and some of, uh, some of these social checks. If done right in the past, you know, you're like, okay, you passed the social check, great. Um, here you go, you, you, I'm increasing their disposition, which you don't tell the player, but it's like, yeah, no, you know, you could do it. Not only are they telling you that thing you want to tell them, I'm increasing their disposition because just the way you interact with them 
they like it. But, on the other hand, you might think you're doing great with them, uh, but some personality types are. It's more difficult to like them. They're going to get pissed off. They catch you. Uh, they're music. The clever personality type. They are going to... You take it like a minus 20, I think, to deceive with them because they're very watchful for betrayal. They're very watchful that you might try to... They, they just notice little things. Um, it doesn't go to a huge either, but it's something I like. It's a it thing is with disposition and process. It's something you can relatively easily ignore. Um, but that's a lot of the mechanics. I could go into like a lot more detail, but it's a lot of mechanics. Um, variable settings uh, for the weapons from like only war and stuff for the plasma uh, for the las weapons. I've carried over a lot of mechanics. Like I said can be carried over uh, from only war. A um, few tweaks and stuff. But combat is generally sorted. Of, once we don't have comrades, the background is interesting because rather than going, here's the Glixis sector again. They've written a lot on the Glixis sector. I could, they'd probably just be bored doing the Glixis sector again. Now, that's not to say that I wouldn't be interested in if you go, hey, we're going to use Dark Air Second Edition. The game is going to be done in the Glixis sector. If you turn around and go, yeah, we're going to do, you know, Dark Air again, the Second Edition. I'm going into Harlock Legacy. Boom. You're not going to have big problems. The stats are still relatively similar. Um, enough that with a little bit of forethought, you don't have any huge problems. Even without forethought, if you're good at improvising on the fly, just slight tweaks. You know, some of the skills gone much more like evaluates gone. That's just in commerce. Commerce turns off intelligence, not fellowship. Um, but the setting is near. Once more, you know, they like having near, near setting. Um, well, you know, way over there is a Jericho Reach, but you got your, your wall warp gate. Um, you got the Calypso Sector. You got Chronos Expanse. You got over there, you got the Jericho Reach. You got your Spam in front. You got your Screaming Vortex. And kind of down here is the Ascalon Sector. Now I know you got Ixion and Skyrus nearby as well, but. Um, the Ascalon sector is different from the Glixis sector in some ways. It's different enough to be interesting, but it's near, so you can have people go around like, I've got a player in my game who, you know, this is first Dark Air second edition game, but he knows Glixis sector, so his character is from Malfi. But Ascalon joined the Imperium. According to legend, Ascalon joined, the Ascalon sector joined the Imperium during the Great Crusade. They have a local warp storm which is kicking up. It's it's been there for a very long time and it waxes and wanes, but it's been kicking up more of late. It's called Pandemonium. This has made warp travel in and out of the area quite difficult. So less astropaths than normal. Um, it's going to be a little more difficult for the cavalry to come in. I like it because you have this very like the clicks of sectors. It's it's thousands of years old, whatnot, but. Ascalon, Great Crusade, huge old, they detail one of the, uh, um, in Forgotten Gods, they detail one of the Rogue Trader, two of the Rogue Trader dynasties, and one of them, legend has it, came in there, you know, they came in, helped explore the area, helped, you know, conquer the area, presumably, um, and, you know, you know, United these different worlds, which had, as many of them had humans who were there before, who joined, well, they were the ones who joined peacefully, you know, and became nobles or whatever in there, or they weren't nobles, they just jumped the ship with the uh, Imperium. They might have been, like, the 10% who betrayed the rest of their homeworlds. Well, but this is the Great Crusade, so they came peacefully. But it's 10,000 years. A little bit unsure, so you can do what you want there in some respects. But there weren't a phrase written by Magnet or the Sigilite. So you can have just huge ancient There's this feeling of your soul is going to collapse any minute. Ten thousand years. And some of the hives and places that predate the Imperial. We're talking pre-Imperial hives. What kind of, you know, if you'd, you could, I could happily do a game set on one of the hive worlds like Juno or the Solium, which are detailed in the books, and have it being under hive, you can completely change things if you had to me, or um, a hive quake in the group or the group or a gang or something, there's a hive quake, it opens up the whole section, you find a pre imperial section with some kind of crazy thing or something from just such a huge time uh, back. You could bring yourself from Temple. The thing is, it's close enough to the Clixus sector, you can 
mine, even if you decide to go, yeah, I'm going to do Ascalon Sector, you can mine the Calixa Sector for things. Uh, sorry, the, the, the Dark Horse First Edition and the Calixa Sector for things you liked. So if you like the Temple Tendency, hey, this place is 10,000 years old, Temple Tendency, there could be some you know, elements that still lingering around here. And it's close enough, but far enough away with Dwarf Storms. And you can very easily just have it like, yeah, it's difficult to get in and out for one. You just have yet to warp the panel one's kicked up enough that it's damn near impossible to get in. Like as in just kind of boom, you are cut off. And hey, you could have like you could be playing a game where you are members of the Inquisition and suddenly now that it's cut off, but on the local level or some still travel. You could have a conspiracy of planetary governors secede and suddenly you've got this civil war. And, no, space streams aren't just going to have an order. There might be local. You may have it if there's a, you know, Dead Watch Watch Fortress or a Watch Station. But they've got other threats to do it. Um, and the warp paths here, because of pandemonium, are difficult to deal with. You've got these very rich power forwards with, like, Juno, which is the sector capital, have, have better warp routes between them, but worlds get cut off. And old war fruits reopen, storm set down, and it, worlds which haven't heard from the Imperium in hundreds, maybe thousands of years, you know, people are going back in there, where it's adeptism and Nostratum, or other things, you could have culture problems, because, hey, what happens if you have the, um, what happens if you have war storms die, and the player, and the, you know, a rogue trader goes in, or the other thing Nostratum goes in, go, hey, where your taxes, guys, and, this world goes, oh, the Imperium is safe, that's great. And much like they deal with to a degree in uh, in Jericho Reach, if you look into right to the background, you're like, oh, great, the Imperium hasn't fallen, we've just been cut off for ages. And then with horror, as they look at the Imperium, they look at the Ecclesiarch and go, that's heresy, that's not right. Which, the way they're taught and handed down, you know, there could be a few worlds in the, the Task One sector, which are like that. But it's just this feeling of old denial about how corrupt is, which... In comparison, the Calixa sector almost feels, you know, it's always been horribly corrupt in many ways <laughs> with a capital C. And it's been kind of reveling, rolling around in it. Whereas Ascalon, it's just complete denial put on another layer of wake up in the wig. Just they do tell, like, they give the kind of feel what Juno of noble houses who have holdings in our plans, which might have been lost different things, but they just keep, they're going through the motions. They've never been to the agri worlds that they, you know, they own an entire continent of all these things, completely divorced with reality. Uh, you know, it's almost like, it was like, oh, well, we joined up during the Great Crusade. We're you know, part of the founding of the Imperium. You know, aren't we great? That's the mess up. I don't think they've, given, I don't think I've found details on um, where so which, if any, probably would have been some at least the way the, the Great Crusade was going. Which legion came to Ascalon? That's one of the things I'm not sure about. Now I know for the Jericho Reach, it was the Word Bearers and the Ultramarines were the ones who helped bring the uh, bring it into compliance. But I'm not sure about for Ascalon, which to me you could actually do some various things where you have where it could come up. You could find out your heart. There are night, you know, old night lord facilities, and you know, a war band of night lords or other chaos space marines have taken up residence in and are striking out doing raids from to a really high power level. Um, some chaos. It, it, it's just who came in. That's the kind of thing. That's the little, little detail I, I kind of like. Love. But there's so much. It's ten thousand years you're going with. Um, but the feel you get is very good. They do a decent job. Of this actually. Oh, that um, something I meant to mention. First, they do a very cool thing of with the powers. Rather, they just give these pages um, that you can see of can't make it out terrible. Or you see these little bubbles, and each and they're connected with the different things in between them. And it's a little bit difficult to make out there. But it, it's a visual representation of this is the chart going between the psychic powers, how they deal with it. Um, basically, if you're going 
this one is the pyromancy tree so first you have to get a manipulate frame then you can get fire shield or spontaneous combustion and how it goes along down the line for that group of powers which is nice but they give enough details to give you a launching point from for the adventures the the adversaries and allies in the back of the book they, they get actually actually one of the covers detail a lot is how how run the solium um and they give it some good ideas on the cults so they're very inventive um i quite like them like they have this cult which comes up in the and it's a bit of a spoiler out here it comes up in the core of a book but um detailed more in some of the adventures they brought out um called callers of sorrow or uh I'm not sure if that's their name, that's the name of one of the groups that do different things. But they are a Nurgle chaos cult. But they set themselves up in a cell like structure. So it's basically a bunch of small cults, but they're very secret. And you can wipe one out, but there might be only one or two members in that entire group of, you know, 50 or so people who knew anybody outside that group. And they're Nurgle. And they, they're very insidious because they recruit people by giving aid to the poor and the downtrodden. And this is the Imperium. There is lots of poor and there is lots of downtrodden. Um, so I like that. They give details on some of the different cults. It's pretty cool. And they give out some pretty decent stats for a variety of different troops, for a variety of different uh, enemies, and just people you're going to encounter. So they give stats for like uh, an Apex Noble, which is a Spire, to a Necron term, Spire Noble, um, Tech Priest, and they have your enemies, and I actually like this. They've got the the, the strains for the cells that I called. They particularly go into detail in them. Great fun, I actually create like them. And they detail the gangs in the soul. The soul was one of the places they really detail. This is um, because mainly because it comes up in the dark pursuits, um, which is the adventure at the back of the book. And I quite like it. It links in quite nicely to the adventure in the GM's kit. And to the adventures in the um, adventures GM kit and the adventures in um, Forgotten Gods, they're all kind of linked and meant to go together. You can play them in different orders, but it's best to go, you know, Coral Book, GM's kit, and then go to Forgotten Gods. And they're actually there are. I'll try and put in the link in the, in the button. There's a thread on uh, Fancy Flight forums for Dark Heresy where. People put up these as basically all traditional counters, and I turn one of them into a just one of the counters as encounters meant to be for this. I put them, it, it was a horrifying dinner that I found so an, interesting to read. I put my players through it, and we had fun. They were active quite a, a horrendous amount at this um, heretical dinner party and different things. Um, just a little bit of tweaks and stuff. We had a lot of fun with it. <laughs> but the adventure to back of the book, it's a good introduction. Um, it gives you, you some good ideas. It just very much laying out here is where the different things are. This is the setup for this chapter of the adventure, which is usually broken into three parts, like acts. And they go, here's what the setup of things currently. Here's generally how people react. It has a bit more fake news as a GM that's not going A to B to C to D. And it, it does have stuff where, like, well, if the players have gone from A. To two somehow, that's nothing to do with the adventure. You know, advice, and they do with the adventures that follow on. They are pretty hands up. Sometimes go like, if the players just go, you know what, this red herring, or not even red herring, but this thing that's connected, but not what the, the adventure is supposed to do, like this lower priority thing. We're going to focus on this. They'll just kind of ha ha go hands up and say, look, here's here's a paragraph or two, and what you can do with that, but. This book would never be finished. You know, it'd be three or four times the size if you had to detail every little thing. Um, generally speaking, when it comes down to it, I really like it. I prefer to Dark Heresy first edition. Um, I prefer to a lot of them. I love the aptitude system that they've introduced into more recent games. That really works for me. Um, it allows characters to grow more organically uh, than the previous ones. For example, I'm in a Rogue Trader game at the moment. And because that still runs after ranks, I'm in one or two Rogue Traders at the moment, but 
one one is it's still going off Rogue Trader, which is very similar to Dark Air's first edition. It's got ranks. I'm playing an navigator. I can't get scrutiny until rank five or six. In Starship Comet, there's not much I can do that I'm good at. I just roll, put your back into it. That that's 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 what I can do. If I had scrutiny, I could do lock on targets. I could scan human ship. I could do things. But because it goes, no, you don't get this till this point. It locks you in. And more of my issues with uh, like Arch Militant, where you go, no, Arch Militant, you'll be getting the range talents. You don't need that many close combat talents. Like, what? This that, what? That doesn't make sense to me. Now, you can go off and do, you can do some straightforward stuff, like I was saying, with the different combinations of backgrounds, and then you can expand it in game, different things, and you know, your aptitudes go. I had the idea of a, you could have a character who's, you know, a Voidborn for the homeworld, Adeptus and Astralum for the background, Warrior, which might sound crazy, but this spaceship that goes, uh, it's like the idea of, like, he was actually, you know, born to a ready for hereditary position for one of these guards that guards the spaceship for the administrator that goes around and collects, you know, paperwork from the various different administrator places. And he's one of the guards that protects it with his life. Or he might not have, you know, it's not as averse as being a Meridian Imperial guard, but he's a crazy, you know, it's like, you will, I am a protector of the ancient archives. You know, we gather all these up. We, you know, basically, we take the tax returns for the planets, go around the sector. You know, which might take a very long time. You're going to things, or you you take them from a subsector or a sector capital, they all get brought there, and you deliver it off. And somehow your characters end up in the Inquisition, um, which is going to be very different. But you're still a warrior. You can still fight because you can train for these different things. But you understand bureaucracy and things better than a normal warrior. Whereas before, you really had in Dark Castle First Edition, you had homeworld background. Uh, sorry, homeworld. Rank this is your class, and then they put an alternate rank, but it just started getting very, very, very big. Now, they have put in in some of the supplemental books so far, they have put in Forgotten Gods, um, alternate bonuses, uh, which I won't go into detail yet about, but it's for pre existing worlds. And it's basically instead of this bonus, you get this bonus because instead of just being like a normal ship this the ship you were from was a merchant ship so there's more of a focus on commerce and things which i quite like um small changes up <sighs> generally i would be i like it so much i would be and i'd already kind of start doing this with only war like we're running a rogue trader game or defense running a rogue trader game and we suggested and he went off and did um rather than using the rank system we used the life path system we got our stuff and we got our gear and we got the starting stuff. But then we just went off. It was like, well, your rogue trader characters pick like eight aptitudes. And then we'll use only war for our engine effectively. I won't move it along where applicable. Obviously, Starship come out still has rogue traders like the only place the best printed. I love the fact that in Black Crusade, which could easily be just as, you know, parts of Caribbean space, but with chaos, <laughs> you can be of just as much rogue trader game with chaos than you could with a normal rogue trader game. It just. Turns around and goes, if you want more details and doing like Starship combat and stuff and Starships, look at Rogue Trader. <laughs> it's like, no, we're not putting in like fucking chapter or two. No, we're not dealing with that. But I put we put into app shoes and we liked it like that and it works. Um, but at this stage, I'm looking at it and I really, I really like it. Um, not just for running Dark Heresy. If I want to run a Rogue Trader game, I'm going to use this as my base major. I'm going to steal some drug creator book, like the Starship Combat things. But this will be my engine. You can make you could even you could just go. Aside from the essential stuff you need from Rogue Trader, you could just go. I'm just going to stick to the backgrounds of this. There is on Dark Brain, a uh, a user has put up um, what was they been working on for additional roles and backgrounds, basically to do Rogue Trader. But this is the engine. I don't agree with all the stuff they're, uh, you know, all the stuff they're doing. But still interesting. I'll put in the link down below. Um, if you want to see how, uh, there's probably people that's online stuff. But I was in a game. A friend of mine was running online. Um, we had about three sessions in. Uh, 
interesting game, interesting take to ways doing things. I'm hoping to restart it again soon, but I'll put a link for that down below as well if you want to see how, you know, live play uh, over Google Hangouts works out and how we're doing. But uh, if you like 40K and you like role playing, it's a good book. Some people are going to prefer to go to debt watch and things. Um, they, you know, they want to get their space run on or they want to get the chaos on. But generally speaking, if you like the first Dark Heresy, unless you just absolutely hate change, if you liked, you know, how things have gone on, how they've incrementally improved things. Oh, one last thing. You're going to like it, but uh, let's see. They've put in a few additional talents for um, for investigation, to put it like, because there's so many skills for combat and talents that you can invest in. Well, there's only so many, there's only a small number of skills for combat, but there's so many talents for combat. They put one to it. There is one that when you fail an awareness check, the sound, you can roll your awareness again with a minus 10 penalty, but it's for free. It's just a free reroll with a minus 10 penalty on top of whatever penalty already is. I really like that. They've got some additions, some perks. I I would be happy to run this for like rogue, use this as my engine for rogue trader. Um, to agree, debt watch. Although with those, I would be hacking out. I've already done a debt watch game with aptitudes and stuff using only war, hacking out uh, the bits I need from the other systems. And, you know, using this as my engine, running it all off this. Um, I've had a decent bit of experience with it now. I've read over the books, seen different things. I had nine sessions of running, and I've had three sessions of playing, and. There is more sanity in this, generally speaking. There's a few niggly bits, uh, but there's more sanity in this than there has been in some of the previous ones. And if you decide, if you, uh, the mechanics are just outright better, you might not like the setting. I like the setting. I think a lot of people will like the setting, but it's 40k. If you don't want this, or you want to go for a different feel, you're going. You know, I did the clicks sector, and you're reading. You go. This is a little bit too similar for my taste. If you want to take this. Go a slightly higher power setting if you have details already and you want to go, okay, well, you're in Quister or LA just running around. If you want to do more combat or have a backdrop of war going on, depending on what bad guys you want, what kind of things, but you can make up your own stuff. That's always, they're, they're always, one of the things I like is that they're always right, yeah, I'm just 40 case you, you go off into the sector, wherever. You can do it in the spin word front, or you could do it in the Jericho Reach if you want to kill your players, or if you just want to corrupt and kill your players and damn their souls for eternity, there's always the Screaming Vortex, if you details from the previous games on those. And, yeah. Last words then is unless you're sitting there just listening to what I'm saying, going, you know what, I have absolutely no interest in this book, if you like your 40k RPGs, and you like doing a bit of investigation, um, it's a good one to go for. It's a good pickup. Uh, as on most fantasy flight RPG books, the price is it's a bit pricey, but solid. It's a worthwhile investment. Um, I'm going to do some videos later on in the week, hopefully, on some of the supplements first, because I know some people have specifically been requesting Dark Heresy stuff. Um, I hope to sit down at some point and work to figure out where I left off the Kanaw Grenadiers videos, because we were fairly close to the end. And we had a very good time actually finishing that up. Um, I'm not sure if it, how, it, it's been a while since I ran that, but I can uh, give out the details on that. But thanks for watching. And uh, please, if you agree or disagree or have different thoughts on Dark Hair 2nd Edition or any questions, please leave them below in the comments. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.